Welcome back, people. After speaking at length on the architecture of the JVM and its instruction set, today we look at how to generate JVM bad code using the SM library. I'll show you a simple example to give you a sense of how it works, and then I'll give you some tips and tricks on how you can use the library effectively. I've chosen to talk about the ASM library today. ASM is fairly general and comprehensive, and it enables fine-grained control over the generated bytecode, which, on the other hand, means that it's quite low level. There are a few other libraries that help with bytecode generation, so I'm gonna list them briefly. BCL is very similar to ASM, but I think ASM is overall superior. The JavaScript library is higher level, making it somewhat easier to use for quick tasks, but it's not as comprehensive as ASM. Then you have a few more libraries like ByteBuddy or CGLib, which focus on higher level goals using bytecode as a tool. The most notable example of higher level pattern that these libraries focus on is dynamic proxies. So a dynamic proxy is a class that implements a given interface automatically, and typically it will delegate all the methods to under an implementation of the same interface. But it will run some code before or after that delegation. So for instance, proxies can be used for caching the results of the delegate, or for logging, or for validating arguments. The point of proxies is that you don't implement them manually, as that would be a ton of boilerplate. One way to implement proxies is to use reflection in Java, but that's fairly slow. Instead, you can use a library that generates a proxy using Java bytecode, and then you get faster proxies. So let me show you a small ASM code example we're going to generate the classical L word program. So in this snippet, we set the class name to test, and then we create a class writer, which will be used to construct the class file. The compute frames argument tells the class writer to compute the stack frames. This is a concept which is related to the notion of type state that we saw in the last video. Basically, these frames are instruction annotation in the bytecode, and they tell the JVM the size of the stack and the type of values on the stack at that point. You normally have to specify these frames for every instruction that can be reached through multiple paths. Basically any instruction that can be reached through a jump because it can be reached through the jump or it can be simply reached by uh, processing the previous instruction. However, ASM is able to generate these frames for us. Next, we see that we want to build a public class that generates the Java Lang object class uh, using GVM8 bytecode. Next, we create a method visitor, which will be used to emit bytecode for that specific method. In this case, it's a public static method called main, which takes an array of string as argument and returns void. So this part here is what gives the arguments the return value. Okay, so V is for void, and this uh, bracket L Java lang string, that's for the arguments, which is an array of string. We'll see the explanation for this notation at the end of the presentation. Next, we call visit code to start emitting instruction. And the first instruction we're going to emit is a get static instruction to get system.out, whose type is print stream. After that, we emit a LDC instruction to load the string hello from the constant pool. ASM automatically manages the constant pool for you so when you call this function, ASM will remember that it needs to sort the hello string in the constant pool. Next, we invoke the println method, which is a method of class printStream, which takes a string as input and returns void. We then emit the return instruction, which simply returns. Then we call visitEnd to signify that we're done emitting instruction for the method. The visitMax method sets the maximum value for the size of the stack and the number of locals used in this method. If you pass minus one there, ASM will compute those values automatically and, and probably that's what you should do. And finally, we call visitN on the class writer to say that we're finished with the class. So now we have specified the bytecode for our class using ASM, and now we can actually get that bytecode as an array of bytes and for that, we simply need to call the method called toByteArray. Now we're going to do something cool, which is to immediately load our new test class in the current JVM. For this, we'll use a ByteArray class loader, which is a class I've defined myself, and I will put the link in the description. It's just a 10 lines long extension of the basic class loader class. So all it does is make a protected method public so that you can 
pass the bad code array to define the class. So we call this method define class with the class name and with the bad code array, and that gives us a class object. Now we can use Java reflection to call the main method. The second argument here gives the type of the parameter. Since in Java, you can have overloading, which is different methods with the same name, but different parameters. And I should say that this get method is a variadic method. So if you have more than a single parameter, then you will just add more arguments, one per parameter. We invoke that method. The first parameter is for the receiver, but since this is a static method, okay, it's the main public static void main method, we pass no. And we pass an empty string array as the parameter. If you're wondering about that weird object cast that we have here, that's because otherwise Java is not sure if the array is supposed to be a single argument that is an array or an array that contains all arguments. Here it's a single argument that's also an array, and so we cast the object to clarify our intent. And that's it for this hello world example. You can try it out uh, yourself to see that it works, and it does print hello. So what does ASM offer? What's the value added? Well, like I mentioned, it manages the constant pool for you, for all the constant instructions and all the LDC instructions. It does take care of sizing the stack and the space for locals. That's the function set max where we passed minus one. It also have managing jump targets using labels. So instead of counting instructions and specifying offsets manually for the go to and the if instructions, you create an ESM label and you pass that instead and ESM will compute all the offsets for you. There are other things, but the core of what you have to take care of when using ESM is really emitting a stream of instructions. I should say that ASM can be used for other things than just emitting a stream of instructions. So this is just about this particular use of the library. So let's assume you want to use ASM to implement your language. Here are a few pointers on how to get started. Imagine that you have a language feature in mind. How do you figure out which bytecode to emit? Well, you could rewatch the previous video for one, but another thing you could do is to use JavaP or this website which runs it for you. And that will show you what the Java compiler emits for a certain program. So it's a cool way to reverse engineer what the Java compiler does. If you need references and documentation on what the instruction do, you can look in the Java specification, that's the canonical source, or on the Wikipedia page, which is a bit shorter and easier to scan. Regarding ASM itself, uh, refer to javadoc, or my favorite method, jump to the source for a meta visitor in your IDE, and do a text search on the instruction. For instance, if I do that and I search for get static, I'll find I need to call the visit field instruction. Well, visit field I-N-S-N, as they use this shortcut. I need to call that method to emit the get static instruction. There's also a manual. It is very long, but it is very well structured. And it's really worth a look if you're looking to get into ASM seriously, or if you can figure it out in any other way. It also costs nothing to open it and just do a quick text search in there uh, if you're stuck. Like I just said, ASM can do a lot of things and we're barely scratching the surface here. So the manual will tell you more about all these other uses. So in my own experience in preparation for uh, this talk and a talk about GVM instruction, I implemented the bytecode compiler for my sign language. I'll put the link there and it will also be in the description. I wrote some generic utilities you can reuse, notably stuff to works with class object, and a method that emits the shortest possible instruction to load the constant that you specified. I was actually surprised that ASM didn't do this automatically. If you use ASM to implement your language, you will probably need to write down your own language specific utility. In particular, you will want to map your semantic level types to Java types that will represent them at runtime. And you want to get type descriptors for those types. So we'll see right after uh, the syntax of those type descriptors. Note that you can generate multiple methods at the same time using different method visitor, and this can be useful in some cases. I mentioned earlier that the JVM has support for debugging information, such as mapping the locals, which are anonymous, to variables, which have names, and adding line numbers to instructions. You can specify this debugging information using ESM, of course. So now we get into some of the notations, notably for type descriptors. There are actually two kinds of type descriptors, 
field descriptors, which describe the value of types, and they're called field descriptors because actually the only time you need to specify them is when you define or access a field. Then there are method descriptor, and those are basically all the field descriptors for the parameters, followed by the field descriptor for the region type. It's only one bit of syntax, and that's these parentheses there. And you don't need to separate the field descriptors for the parameters, and that's because of the syntax you always know exactly how much to read, as we'll see. Other things that you will need to specify is references to classes. Those must be written as slash separated binary names. I'm not sure why they use slash there. I think it's a bit historical and probably is related to how Java classes are stored and found on the disk. Here you can see the binary class name for Java util string. There are a few other rules, for instance, inner classes are separated by a dollar and not by a slash. Uh, note that these names are unique. So if we have a class A with a inner class X, so the class X is defined within class A, so it's an inner class, and we have a class B that extends A, then we could imagine that we have two names for X, okay? So imagine that it's in the package pkg, it could be pkg slash A dollar X or pkg slash B dollar X. Well, only the first one is valid. That's the binary name. So now that we know about binary class names, how do we create field descriptors and from there on the method descriptors? Well, primitive types are represented by a single letter. Most of them will be pretty familiar, but there are a few traps. For instance, uh, a byte is B, and because of that, a boolean is Z for some reason. A long is not L, it's J, because it comes after I, I presume. This is sad because they use the L prefix before class names. And these class names are slash separated binary class names. Also note that this class name ends with a semicolon. And that's the reason why you don't need any separators, because either it's a single character or it's a class name. And then you know it starts with L and you need to read until you see a semicolon. Finally, for arrays, you just have a, an opening square bracket followed by the type of the component. So if you wanted to write the type for a two-dimensional array of integer, you would write the opening square bracket followed by another opening square bracket followed by i. This table, which I shamelessly copy-pasted from a specification, also lacks v, which is used for void types. And the reason is that this is a table for field descriptors, and void types are only for methods, so only for method descriptors. And with that, we've wrapped up our talk of code generation. The next and last part of the course that we tackle will be optimization. Until then, I hope you all have a great time.